Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you for having me here today. It's despite the inclement weather, thank you very much for coming out and uh, braving that weather today. It seems pretty, uh, pretty unseasonable for the middle of October, but there you go. You never quite know what you're going to get in Minnesota. Uh, as Liz said, I work at, sure. I work at the Minnesota Historical Society um, and through the James J. Hill House, so I've done tours of the James J. Hill House. I also do walking tours of the Summit Avenue neighborhood and of F. Scott Fitzgerald's neighborhood uh, as well. So if you ever need someone to talk about F. Scott Fitzgerald, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, he's one of my subjects of interest. So um, today I'll tell you a little bit more about James J. Hill and the Great Northern Railway in Wyzetta. I'll start with giving you uh, kind of a, an introduction to James J. Hill. I'll tell you a little bit about his life story, uh, what he did, and then also talk about some of his other interests in Wyzetta as well, because they certainly weren't limited to the Great Northern Railway. And then we'll get into um, his time in Wyzetta and kind of the issues between the village of Wyzetta and the Great Northern Railway. So with all that being said, we'll head into some of the life of James J. Hill. And he was born on a farm near Guelph, Ontario in Canada on September 16th, 1838. You might also hear his birthplace listed as Aramosa or Wellington. It's kind of the farm was sort of right in between all those uh, small little towns there. And that's an area about 60 miles outside of Toronto. So not too far away, although at that time, certainly with the transportation, it was uh, a decent distance. Hill's parents were both born in Ireland. And they came over to Canada. His father came over in 1829, his mother in 1832, and they got married in 1833. Uh, <clears throat> James J. Hill's father died when James was 14 years old, and shortly after that, James left home and went to the United States, eventually made his way to St. Paul, Minnesota, when he was about 18 in 1856. And when he came to St. Paul, he, his first job was working as a clerk for a steamship company. And Hill was actually born without a middle name, he gave himself the middle name of Jerome when he was a teenager, and he did that in honor of one of Napoleon Bonaparte's brothers. And it's kind of, yeah, kind of an interesting thing to do, give yourself your own middle name. Uh, but it, it's kind of a nice connection because he certainly, James J. Hill, I think, uh, very much embodied Napoleon's very radical idea at the time of meritocracy. This idea that you can work your way up, you can rise in life thanks to education and hard work rather than noble lineage. And I think James J. Hill is a very good example of that. I mean, certainly he was somebody who did not come from very much and uh, really achieved a great deal in his life. Um, and he's really a rags to riches success story. Uh, if you think of the Horatio Alger books that were popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, he, re he really is that type of character in Come to Life. Uh, you know, he starts out as a clerk and through his education, his hard work, his persistence, he's able to become, of course, eventually president of the, of the Great Northern Railway and become very, very successful and very wealthy uh, as well. Hill had an eighth grade education. He told a journalist, I never went to school a day after I was 14 years and three months old. And that was exactly when his father died. So that really put an end to his formal education. But obviously he was a very smart guy. He was a keen reader of all kinds of subjects and an autodidact who really was ruthless in his pursuit of knowledge. And uh, something that one of his biographers said, Michael Malone uh, talks about James J. Hill also had this, you know, he was certainly attuned to the facts and figures and good at math and things like that, but he also had this kind of romantic notion as well. Uh, one of his favorite books when he was a young man was the Sir Walter Scott novel, Ivanhoe. 
And that really, he read it in one sitting, and it just kind of transfixed him. And I think he really has that sort of uh, kind of romantic vision, which I think was something he certainly needed to be the head of a giant railway and construct this railway line from here in the Twin Cities all the way out uh, to the West Coast. And you needed that sort of a kind of broad vision to, to do something like that. And so he really has that kind of side to him as well. He saw the possibilities in things. Uh, and I think you'll see that you see that again and again in his life. He always has, he has a lot of very grand ideas. Some of them come to fruition, some of them don't. Um, he really valued hard work and intelligence. He once told a reporter that the secret of his success was work, hard work, intelligent work, and then more work. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> So he's a very, very smart fellow. Um, one other interesting fact about his childhood, when he was nine years old, he had an accident with a, bow, with a bow and arrow and lost the sight in his right eye. Um, they, didn't, they didn't have to remove the eye, uh, but he didn't have, you know, really was basically blind and it really did not have much vision in that right eye. Although you really can't, you know, all the photos and stuff I've ever seen of him, you really can't tell at all. Um, that there's any impairment uh, in that eye. Uh, but there you go. The, uh, the classic, you know, warning of a parent, you'll put your eye out with that. Yeek. Hill hoped when he was starting out in business to become successful enough to make $100,000. That was his goal, which of course was a, a very large amount of money in the 1850s, and he achieved that goal many, many times over. And he was a very successful businessman before he was ever involved, before he ever bought what became the Great Northern Railway in 1878. Um, he was 40 years old when that happened, and, but before that he was really, you know, he was successful um, thanks to uh, his involvement with, he had, a, he had a shipping company and really knew transportation on the Mississippi River. Uh, but he was certainly successful before ever becoming a railroad owner. He built a large mansion in the lower town neighborhood of downtown St. Paul, uh, which isn't the, not the mansion that we all know and love and take tours of today. Uh, that mansion in lower town is no longer there. But you know, he was very successful even at that time. One of his friends and neighbors in the Lower Town neighborhood uh, was a wholesale grocer named P.F. McQuillan, who was F. Scott Fitzgerald's grandfather. So there's some interesting connections between the Hills and the Fitzgeralds there. Hill had a very large family. I'll show you a picture of some of, some of his family here. He was married to Mar uh, Mary Teresa Mahegan. Uh, her parents were also Irish immigrants. I know, shocking because of that name. It surprised you. Um, and Mary Hill was working, Mary Mahegan was working as a waitress in downtown St. Paul at a hotel when she met James J. Hill. And they were engaged in 1864, and she went off to finishing school in Milwaukee for three years, and in 1867 they got married. And during the time, right before they got engaged, uh, Mary, who is a very devout Catholic, wrote a letter to her priest, um, and she was kind of, you know, she, she wasn't necessarily having misgivings about marrying James J. Hill, but she, uh, you know, kind of wondered what her new life would be. And her priest basically said to her, you know, you are marrying somebody who is going to be a great man. This is going to be, you know, a a big adventure and it is certainly, you know, you're, you're not going to have to be working as a waitress at a hotel anymore once you marry this guy. So it's kind of interesting that some people saw that in James J. Hill even then, uh, that he was somebody really destined for bigger things. So James and Mary married in 1867. They had 10 children together, nine of whom survived into adulthood, which Honestly, it was pretty good odds for those days. Infant mortality rate was about uh, two and a half out of every 10 children uh, wouldn't make it past the age of five or so. And he was probably closest to his son, Louis. 
who ends up taking over the Great Northern when James J. Hill eventually steps down in 1912. So in this picture, it might be from Louis's wedding. Louis's kind of in the middle there uh, with the beard. And of course, James is off to the side. Uh, it's always kind of funny in some of these you know, big family photos. You know, he's, he's never the center, of course. I mean, it's usually a child's wedding or something, but he's just kind of, you know, in the back, you know, there, off to the side. Um, and his wife, Mary, is sitting on the chair uh, closest to James. And uh, because, because I work there, I kind of have a vested interest in telling you a little bit about the James J. Hill House on Summit Avenue. Uh, there's a picture of it built in the Richardsonian Romanesque architectural style. Uh, built between 1888 and 1891 at a total cost of $931,275 and one penny. Kept very exact records. And that would be about $26 million in 2019 dollars. Uh, so pretty, pretty expensive, pretty grand. And certainly if you wanted to remake the Hill House in the, in a similar style with all of the wood carvings and, uh, you know, this beautiful stained glass windows and the 24 karat uh, gold leaf ceiling in the dining room, it'd probably cost you a heck of a lot more than $26 million. But uh, it's a very large house. It's 36,000 square feet. It's bigger than Glensheen. I have to kind of throw that in there. We have sort of a you know, friendly rivalry with you know, the other giant mansion of the era up in Duluth, but we, we are a little bit bigger. So there's 42 rooms plus 13 bathrooms, 22 fireplaces, 16 chandeliers, and a two-story art gallery. The art gallery is on uh, the left-hand side of the house. You can see in this picture where the big, uh, where the skylights are off to one side. And he was a big art collector, uh, bought and sold about 250 paintings during his lifetime. If you go to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts today, really kind of the core of their 19th century French landscapes came from James J. Hill's collection. Um, if you look, if you look, if you look very closely on like who gave it to the museum, it's all, it's not necessarily James J. Hill, but it's often one of his uh, children or grandchildren, the Slades, uh, or one of those other branches of the family. So Hill and railroads. Uh, he works in transportation. Work on uh, as a clerk for a steamboat company that eventually you know owns his own uh, bunch of steamboats on the Mississippi River. And I think his really, so he really had a deep knowledge of transportation before he ever became involved in the day-to-day -day operations of railroads. Um, and I think that's something that really helped him and really helped the Great Northern become the success that it was. Certainly some of the other transcontinental transcontinental railroads, you know, you had uh, people who at the top were kind of more just putting up the money, weren't as involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the railroad, but Hill certainly was. He was very deeply involved uh, in everything connected with the Great Northern. And in 1878, Hill and a group of other investors buy the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, uh, which had gone into receivership five years beforehand. That eventually gets uh, renamed the uh, St. Paul and Manitoba and Pacific, and then eventually the Great Northern in 1889. And as I said, I think his knowledge of transportation before he ever got into the railroad was one of the reasons why it was so successful. Uh, the Great Northern was not, uh, was built entirely with private money. They didn't take any land grants from the United States government. Um, and it's also the only transcontinental that didn't go bankrupt. So thanks to James J. Hill, I think in large part. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Hill's personality. He really, he was somebody who saw the big picture and also mastered the tiny details of his job as well. Uh, there's a quote from uh, Michael Malone who wrote a biography of Hill. And he writes, his genius lay precisely in his ability to master detail while fashioning broad vision and strategy. 
And I think that's very true. He was somebody who had, had the big picture and also really knew the nuts and bolts of the Great Northern as well. There's a great story that he was once traveling through the Dakotas and he spotted engine number 94. And armed with that one piece of information, just the number of the engine, he walks over, addresses the engineer by name, and tells him that he knows, you know, this engine has recently been in for repairs, so, you know, how's it doing? Is it still, you know, is everything okay with it? And that was just, he just had that kind of computer mind that knew all those details and all of those things. Um, he also, you know, he also certainly has his uh, prickly side to him. He once fired a station master because he couldn't stand the man's name, which was Spittles. It's a funny name. I don't know if I'd fire somebody over it, but there you go. Um, his personality really fed his success. Um, it's kind of difficult to imagine him, as, him being as successful as he was with a different personality. Uh, E.J. E. Griggs, whose father was an early business partner with Hill, said about Hill, he had the reputation of being an exacting man and hard to get along with, but at the same time it was recognized these qualities made him the forceful man. He was a man brilliant in large achievements. And I think that's certainly true. I mean, if he, if he had been a you know, sort of boring, dull person, he probably would not have uh, started the Great Northern, you know, founded, uh, well, taken over the, what becomes the Great Northern, built it all the way out to the West Coast. I don't think that would have been in his personality if it, if it would have been different. Um, he was nicknamed, of course, the Empire Builder, and that name still lives on today as the Amtrak train that goes out, uh, goes through the Twin Cities all the way out to the West Coast. He'd be very, very pleased uh, that it's still called that, I'm sure. And on his death certificate, when he passed away in 1916, his occupation was listed as capitalist, which I just think is a great fact. And so, I mean, very, very true for who he was, but I just kind of love that, that even, you know, capitalist, <laughs> and not railroad owner or anything else, but capitalist. So there you have it. And uh, for F. Scott Fitzgerald, who I, I can't resist working a little bit of F. Scott Fitzgerald in here, but I think for him, Hill was really much the archetype of the American success story. And he mentions Hill in a couple of his novels and short stories. And in particular, he's mentioned, James J. Hill gets a mention at the very end of The Great Gatsby. Uh, at Gatsby's funeral, Gatsby's father comes back and says about Gatsby, if he'd have lived, he'd have been a great man. A man like James J. Hill, he'd have helped build up the country. So certainly in you know, Gatsby's father's eyes, you know, Hill is this, uh, this archetype of success. And there's another short story that, uh, where Fitzgerald mentions Hill. It's a short story called Absolution. And it was originally meant to be a part of The Great Gatsby and uh, kind of tell a story of when Gatsby is about 12 or 13 years old. And eventually Fitzgerald decided that was just kind of too much, too much background information about Gatsby. So he ends up cutting it from the novel, making it a separate short story. But he, uh, he's writing about the main, uh, the main character's father, Gat who is Gatsby's father. And he writes, his two bonds with the colorful life were his faith in the Roman Catholic Church and his mystical worship of the empire builder, James J. Hill. For 20 years, he had, a, he had lived alone with Hill's name and God. So I think pretty interesting to see that for Fitzgerald, Hill is definitely this kind of uh, larger than life figure of American success and kind of the, kind of the ultimate capitalist. And Hill uh, really wasn't, you know, he certainly wasn't in the railroads just to make quick money off of it. Uh, as I said, you know, he was successful before he built the railroads. Uh, but he's also really interested in the long-range survival of the Great Northern and the Great Northern Line. And I think this is part of the reason why he was so interested in building up communities along the Great Northern. He's very interested in farming gets really into cattle breeding to develop these hardier breeds of cattle 
that can survive and thrive in the harsh Northwest. Uh, they would hold scientific seminars on Great Northern trains, on crop rotation, cattle, dry farming, all of these different things. And Hill, you know, whatever he's interested in, he kind of, you know, dives into it and learns as much as he can about it. And I think you really see that with, uh, with the Great Northern. I mean, he wanted to make sure that there would be business for his trains, settlements to support the railroad. And I mean, you can kind of see that as, you know, certainly there's an amount of self-interest in there. I mean, anything that uh, helps the Great Northern Line will also, you know, help his pocketbook and, you know, allow his mansion to you know, stay heated and things like that. But I think he really did have this larger interest in, uh, in building up all these communities along the Great Northern. And he really saw the railroad as the lifeblood of the Northwest. And I think because Hill was, was so smart, talented, and hardworking, I think it disappointed him when other people were not the same way. I think he had very high expectations of people and uh, is disappointed when they don't quite live up to them. He actually fired the architects who were building his house uh, in the middle of construction because he wasn't happy with the way uh, his instructions were being carried on. You know, so he, so he fired them, had the interior designers finish up the house. I think that sort of uh, stands out for his, uh, his high standards. And there's also a story about uh, Hill was once riding on a Great Northern train that was exceeding the speed limit. Uh, and that distressed Hill quite a bit. So he goes up, asks the engineer about it. The engineer has no idea who he's talking to doesn't recognize his ultimate boss, and, and admits, you know, yeah, we're going over the speed limit, you know, no big deal. And he'll fires the guy on the spot because, you know, you're breaking the rules. It's not how it's supposed to go. He had high standards. So that's a little bit about the background of James J. Hill. I'll tell you about Hill and his involvement in YZ. Really kind of starts uh, in 1880, Hill purchased a 160-acre farm on Crystal Bay, um, in between Crystal Bay and Smith's Bay, and he called this farm Hillier, also called Mary Hill, after his wife. And he planned on breeding cattle and livestock at Hillier. Ultimately, he's really kind of heavily interested in Hillier for only about three years or so. In 1883, he bought a much larger farm at North Oaks, which is about mm, 5,000 acres or something like that. So quite a bit bigger. That effective, effectively kind of ends his interest in Hillier. He moves all of his cattle um, to North Oaks in September of 1883 and kind of really scales down uh, his involvement with Hillier. They rented the, he rented out the land to various people after 1883 and then eventually sells it in 1903 to Thomas Shevlin of Minneapolis for $20,000. And it's very clear from uh, the letters about, uh, about Hillier that at the time they were selling it, he was pretty anxious to sell it. Uh, the original price was 25000 That gets dropped down to 20000 He just kind of wanted, uh, he was ready to move it at that point and move on to other things. And I've got a map here. This is a picture of an 1896 uh, map of the area. So you can, and I apologize if this is kind of hard to see uh, for you all out there. But there's this, um, that strip of land uh, actually has Hill's name. It's great because it shows you who owned all of these parcels of land. Uh, so you can see James J. Hill's name is on that strip of land in between uh, Crystal Bay to the left, Smith's Bay to the right, and then there's the railroad um, is running kind of uh, through that land. And then it's pretty close to the Hotel Lafayette as well, which is in kind of the lower left corner of it. And that brings us to our next topic of Hill's involvement with YZ, the Hotel Lafayette. And the Hotel Lafayette opened on July 2nd, 1882. It was an extremely large building. It was 750 feet long, 95 feet wide, five stories tall. 
It's just 40 feet shorter than the IDS Center. If you tip the IDS Center over or stood the Hotel Lafayette up. So very, very large building. Uh, it had 300 guest rooms. And because of the location on this narrow strip of land in between Crystal Bay and Lafayette Bay, all 300 guest rooms had lake views, which is pretty fantastic. That's a, it's always kind of the worst when you go somewhere and you don't get the lake view. But at the Hotel Lafayette, you were assured of having a lake view. And there's some interesting uh, parties and events that happened at the Hotel Lafayette, some celebrations. One of the biggest was on September 3rd, 1883. There's a large party for Henry Villard, who is president of the Northern Pacific Railroad. The party was to celebrate the completion of the Northern Pacific. So there were many famous folks in attendance uh, at that party. Among them, Alexander Ramsey, former governor, of Minnesota, Henry Sibley, the architect Cass Gilbert, uh, the naturalist preservationist John Muir was there, Abraham Lincoln's son was there. It was a big deal. And in addition to all of those people that I mentioned, also in attendance you had Civil War General, former U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant, and then President Chester A. Arthur. And I know, very exciting for all of you Chester A. Arthur fans in the audience. I'm sure there are many, there always are. And Chester, I'll digress just a little bit to tell you a little bit about Chester A. Arthur, um, who had magnificent sideburns, as you can see from this picture here. Really the best sideburns of any president, I think. It's pretty clear. Um, he's a really interesting guy. He was uh, from New York City. He was kind of part of the uh, political machine in New York. So he was very, uh, very connected to that, sort of a typical politician at that time in many ways. He was James A. Garfield's vice president in 1880. And then James A. Garfield is shot uh, by a disgruntled office seeker and and uh, James A. Garfield then lingers um, alive for about three months before he finally died. Um, and he didn't die of the bullet wound, he died from the infection from all the doctors probing the bullet wound. Ugh, I know, really gross. Um, his, his assassin, Charles Giteau, said at his trial, I didn't kill Garfield, his doctors killed him which was really true, unfortunately. Anyway, so, and so Chester A. Arthur, this whole time that Garfield ha has been shot but hasn't died, is really kind of walking on eggshells. He doesn't want to do anything to make it seem like he's trying to grasp for power or anything like that. He really just kind of tries, tries to hide, basically, for those three months. And uh, when Chester A. Arthur becomes president then, everybody kind of expects, oh, he, you know, he's a machine politician, he's from New York, you know, the spoils system, uh, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna just let things go on the way they've been going. But Arthur really kind of fool, uh, fools everybody and becomes well known for his anti-corruption measures. He, uh, and we have civil service reform for really kind of the first time, putting an end to this uh, spoils system where people profit so much um, from their government offices. So he's, so he's really kind of a surprising guy. And anyway, so that, that's my digression on Chester A. Arthur and why, and why he's interesting, in addition to those great sideburns. And so um, Ulysses S. Grant spoke at this party in September of 1883, and President Arthur uh, you know, of course, was asked to say a few words, and he offered a very eloquent toast in which he really turns everything back to uh, Henry Villard, the president of the Northern Pacific, and, you know, says, you know, this really isn't my occasion, this is an occasion to commemorate this achievement. And one of the guests said of Arthur, his manner was modest, cultured, and distinguished. Uh, so he certainly impressed people who saw him there. At that party, according to newspaper accounts of the time, waiters apparently got very, very rowdy, uh, probably getting drunk off of all of the alcohol that was being served, and something of a brawl broke out amongst 
uh, the waiters and the party guests. The Minneapolis Journal replied that uh, former President Grant was hit by a pie plate in the, the belly. And, <laughs> I know, and Villard was hit by a champagne glass in the teeth. Ouch. Yeah, so a really a kind of raucous uh, party in 1883. Uh, most of the waiters for, pla for places like the Hotel Lafayette at that time uh, were Italians or African Americans. So there's certainly some you know, class tension in between, you know, between the wait staff and all of the people they're serving, um, and perhaps some racial tension uh, as well. And as a kind of little side note to that, African-American activist and author W.E.B. Du Bois was a waiter at one of the Lake Minnetonka Resort Hotels in 1888, five years after this. We don't know which hotel he was at, if it was the Lafayette or if it was one of the other ones, but uh, for Du Bois it was really kind of a uh, sobering experience, and he writes about one uh, one. Uh, patron in particular who really kind of sent him over the edge. He writes, you know, it was not his voice, for his mouth was too full. It was his way, his air, his assumption. Thus Caesar ordered his legionnaires or Cleopatra her slaves. Dogs recognized the gesture. I did not. He may be beckoning yet for all I know, for something froze within me. I did not look his way again. Then and there, I disowned menial service for me and my people. So pretty interesting how some of those experiences on uh, Lake Minnetonka might have been influential. And uh, I'll tell you, let's see, we'll talk about the Bell of Minnetonka, which was James J. Hill's steamboat, the largest steamboat on the lake. You can see it here in a picture. It was 300 feet long, had a capacity of 2,500 passengers. So very, very large. Uh, one of the stories I've heard about it was that they had two orchestras, one on each end of the ship, and you wouldn't be able to hear the other one playing, which is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, it was a coal, yes, I think coal-burning steamship. And the 1880s were really, really this boom time for Lake Minnetonka and for Wyzetta as well. There's, and here you can see uh, a much smaller ship in the foreground and the Hotel Lafayette, the giant Hotel Lafayette in the back, looming in the background. During the 1880s, Lake Minnetonka really becomes a nationally popular tourist destination. People are drawn to the area, of course, because of its natural beauty, and then also for health reasons as well. There were lots of yellow fever outbreaks in the American South at that time, and people thought, well, it's better, uh, you know, better to go north. You have these nice, cool lake breezes, and also this beautiful um, environment. And kind of as quickly as this boom starts in the 1880s, in the 1890s, it sort of subsides and uh, becomes harder and harder to attract these guests during the 1890s as the tourist boom slows down. There were uh, nationwide depressions, they called them panics, a panic of 1893 and again in 1897, certainly didn't help anything. Uh, but they still had huge celebrations for July 4th. This is the program for Hotel Lafayette on July 4th, 1893. And at, these, um, at this July 4th celebration, there were huge fireworks celebrations. They included 16 set pieces of historical, emblematic, and allegorical nature, including the earthquake, the bombshells, mammoth balloon rockets, floral bombshells, Niagara Falls, and the presidential scene. I really wish I could have seen that. <laughs> that sounds pretty amazing. So they're trying all of these different things to get, uh, to get people to come back to Lake Minnetonka, to Wyzetta, to all of these uh, hotels. And 
Towards the end of the 1890s, there's a fire at the Hotel Lafayette on October 4th, 1897 in the morning. And this was after the hotel had already closed for the season, uh, so it was vacant. And a fire began somewhere in it. Uh, the fire was noticed fairly quickly, but firefighters, firefighters weren't able to get to it until about three hours after they had first noticed it. And by that time, it was really too late. And of course, I didn't mention, I mean, every, the Hotel Lafayette was built out of wood, uh, really just kind of a tinderbox. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that's a, that'll be a continuing theme in some of the buildings we talk about, that they all burn down. And um, on the right, you can see a, a stereopticon slide of the Hotel Lafayette. You can see how close it was to the railroad tracks as well, with that train uh, zooming by in the foreground. And really kind of symbolic of the end of an era, uh, I think, on Lake Minnetonka. Even though the Lafayette had been losing money for years, uh, Hill was probably going to tear it down in the next year or two anyway, but certainly kind of puts a dramatic uh, period on uh, this time in history. And Hill sold the land that the hotel had stood on with a provision that whatever replaced it had to be a private club, so it wouldn't compete with uh, his other hotel, Hotel Del Otero. And so construction begins on the Lafayette Club in 1899. President William Howard Taft stayed at the Lafayette Club, and which is pretty cool. Hopefully he didn't get stuck in the bathtub. It's a joke for all you Taft fans there. Um, and F. Scott Fitzgerald was apparently an honorary member of the Lafayette Club. I'm not quite sure what it means to be an honorary member, but I found that interesting. One of the only references I've found to F. Scott Fitzgerald outside of St. Paul. It really, it's really hard to kind of place him in Minneapolis or in any of the suburbs out here. So, so I enjoyed that fact. And the original Lafayette Club burned down in 1922. And, of course, is obviously replaced with uh, the current club. And Hill's other big resort hotel that he owned in this area was the Hotel Del Otero, uh, very close to where we are now, only uh, probably about a mile or so away, uh, right where highways 15 and 51 come together. And you can see, so it's this um, the little box kind of right in the center, uh, in between the two bays there. And there's a, and of course there's a railroad track going basically right up to it, the Spring Park Station. Uh, and that was the case with the Hotel Lafayette as well, that there was, that the uh, railroad, uh, the Minnetonka, it was the Minnetonka Beach Station which served the Hotel Lafayette. It was basically right outside the door of it. So it was very easy for people to get to and from these places via the train. So here's a picture of the Hotel Del Otero, uh, another hill property. It opened in 1885, and it had a casino, very large picnic grounds. Hill sold his interest in it in 1906 to George F. Hopkins, and of course, following the pattern here, the Hotel Del Otero burned down in 1945. Unfortunately, fortunately, nobody was injured um, in that fire. And there's a, a beautiful description of the Hotel Del Otero. Uh, area historian Theodore Bleegan described it, and he wrote about it. And he, he writes, On one side was the famed Hotel Del Otero, with its glimpses of a world of fashion and wealth and ease, as we thought a society of finery outside our experience, definitely more elegant than the crowds on the picnic grounds. As we walked slowly past, we liked to look a little enviously at the elegant men and ladies playing croquet on the park's hotel grounds. Kind of like a very, uh, very beautiful image that kind of conjures it up for us and what that must have been like. And here's a picture of Wyzetta in 1867, the year that the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad reached Wyzetta. The population then of Wyzetta was about 30 to 50 people. I mean, it was really a very, uh, very, very small village. 
And from the very beginning, there was controversy about the placement of the railroad tracks. Maybe kind of hard to see in this picture, you've got the, uh, the uh, steamship off on the right, and on the left, you can kind of just barely see the railroad tracks, and then the, uh, there's a railroad car that those people are uh, heading towards. So it's really just on the, so tracks are really just on the other side to the immediate left of the boardwalk that's in the photo. So you can see from that, I mean, it's very, very close to the lake. And that was kind of always uh, controversial uh, for various reasons. Uh, but it certainly offered a pretty, pretty nice view for the people who were on the train. And there's a picture of Wyzetta in 1880. In 1873, the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad goes into receivership. Uh, they go into bankruptcy. Five years later is when Hill and that group of investors buy the St. Paul and Pacific. In 1883, Wyzetta is incorporated as a village. And the very first act of the village council is to demand that the railroad tracks be moved 300 feet away from the lakeshore. And the second ordinance passed by the, uh, by the village council uh, prohibited cows, horses, mules, goats, and other livestock from roaming free around the town. <laughs> and I really, I really like that contrast, that the, you know, the, the first act is all about you know, fighting the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway, and the second one is trying to keep the livestock contained. So they have, they have a bunch of things to work on. Um, and so eventually, and also this area around, uh, around the train tracks was not always in the best of shape. Uh, there would be, you know, Cars just kind of just idle railroad cars on, off on these little spurs, not moving, sometimes filled with garbage. You know, it wasn't very well taken care of. Um, for ver and we can, we can, you know, perhaps blame the bankrupt uh, St. Paul and Pacific for maybe some of that, but they probably weren't paying much attention to this area of town. And so eventually, what happens in the 1880s is the Wyzetta Village Council eventually sues the railroad to get the tracks and the area around that cleaned up. And Wyzetta actually wins in court, and Hill complies with that court order, you know, cleaning up the area, uh, moving, the, moving the smelly garbage cars, things like that. And then there's a second lawsuit where the council sued the Great Northern again to move the tracks away from the lakeshore. Again, there's that demand, and Hill won that second lawsuit, so the tracks remained uh, where they were. And now, and now we get to the, the controversial part, the fun part. So, and then Wyzetta walks, and Hill supposedly said, I'll make Wyzetta walk a mile for 20 years. And I'm very happy I found this photo because it kind of looks like he's shouting that um, in this photo. And unfortunately, I can't tell you the doc. I don't, I don't know if he actually said, I'll make Wyzetta walk a mile for 20 years. I haven't been able to find the, uh, you know, I haven't found a letter or a source for that quotation. It's kind of become part of this mythology around him. But, so did he actually say it? Well, we don't really know. So what ends up happening is the original railroad station it gets torn down in 1893. It's replaced with another station about a mile east of that original one, and this is known as the Holdridge Station. And the end result of that is it forces residents to walk a mile away from where they had been catching the train, and also forces them to walk through a kind of swampy marshland to do so. So this you know, kind of seems like this may have been in retaliation for the second lawsuit against the Great Northern. And here, and here I'm kind of conjecturing and uh, imagining what Hill might have, uh, might have been thinking. But certainly, I think it's certainly possible that, okay, you know, this tiny village sues him the first time and they win, which I'm sure probably annoyed him a little bit. And then they sue him a second time. And even though he wins that second time, you know, he's maybe still annoyed enough that he's like, I'm going to make it hard for these people here in Wyzetta. So that's, again, that's me theorizing about 
James J. Hill's mind. And so uh, eventually during this period as well, the Ferndale Station was built on the western side of town. Uh, so, so they have these two stations on kind of the extreme edges of downtown Wyzetta. Holdridge Station is destroyed by a tornado in 1904, replaced by a small waiting platform. And so during this time in Wyzetta, Wyzetta really booms during the 1880s when uh, we have the, the uh, big tourists boom. And it doubles in population from 132 residents in 1880 to 273 in 1890. And then during the decade of the 1890s, from 1890 to 1900, it only grows by three residents, which seems really odd. So I wonder, I wonder if the fight with Hill may have impeded the growth of the village. I mean, I don't know that for a fact. Certainly the economic downturns of 1893 and 1897 might have played a role, but it's pretty interesting that this, uh, that this lack of growth also coincides with uh, the battle with the railroad and, uh, and not having a station in the middle of town as they used to. And this is a picture of uh, that same 1896 map. So you can see some people have said that Hill, you know, Hill threatened to wipe Wyzetta off the map and that was why he moved the stations. And uh, I don't know about that. On this 1896 map, it's still called, uh, you can see if you can read it from here, uh, it's kind of sort of in the middle. Uh, there is the, what becomes known as the Holdridge Station. On this map, it's still called Wyzetta Station. So certainly that name uh, is still there. And this is basically, so this is basically, um, you know, Lake Street, downtown Wyzetta. The Ferndale Station is like just, you can see like half of the dot. I didn't take a very good picture of this map. Um, but the Ferndale Station is kind of to the extreme left on that side. And then there's a better, this is a uh, 1905 map. So just before the present depot was built in 1906, you can see Holdridge. Holdridge now has a name. Um, it's over on the kind of extreme right side. And then you've got downtown Wayzata and you've got Ferndale uh, right at that intersection there. And we don't have, this is the only photo we have of what was at Holdridge. And this is most likely the small waiting station uh, that was built after the tornado destroys the original Holdridge station. Um, I apologize for the photo quality of this. This is as, as good a photo as I could find. Um, but certainly it is pretty, pretty basic, pretty utilitarian. And there, there's an article uh, I found, I unfortunately don't have a date for this, it, but it's got to be around 1906 or so. Old was at a station now called Holdridge. And, uh, and it says, sentiment dictated the new name of the old Wyzetta station on the Great Northern Road. When the railroad company finally determined to give the Wyzetta people railroad station facilities after long years of intermission, it was necessary to rename the old station, which is a mile or more west of the village. The privilege of making the choice was given to C.H. Babcock, land commissioner of the road who lives at Wyzetta. He selected Holdridge, which is the family name of Florence Holdridge Babcock, his wife. Henceforth, the junction of the Hutchinson and Main Lines will be denominated Holdridge. So it's kind of, a, it doesn't really seem to have, according to this article anyway, it doesn't really seem to have had a name uh, until after the new one was built, which seems sort of odd. In 1905, there's a reconciliation between Hill and the village of Wyzetta. A, Reconciliation ordinance was passed by the village council, thus ending the feud with James J. Hill. In 1906, the current depot was built. The architect for that depot was Samuel L. Bartlett. He built many depots and stations for the Great Northern. Uh, built Glacier Park Lodge out in Montana, and a lot of the buildings around there as well. The depot cost just under $20,500 which would be about 580,000 in 2019 dollars. So pretty, you know, pretty expensive for those days. And uh, in the collection, in the archives at the Minnesota Historical Society, uh, I was able to find the uh, kind of the, the cost sheet for 
the, uh, the current depot. Date of completion, July 1906. And it goes through, uh, goes through all of the features of the depot. Terraza floor, hot water heat. The lighting was actually, it was gasoline gas uh, that it was lit with originally. Uh, not, not electric light. Um, that kind of terrifies me that it was gasoline gas, but... And uh, so there you go. So you can, and at the very bottom, you've got a final cost of $20,462.15. And here's one of the architectural drawings for that depot. Uh, as well, no doubt drawn, drawn up by Bartlett or one of his associates. And I also found some fun photos of the depot. These must have been taken just shortly after it was completed uh, in 1906, I would guess. So you uh, see it here. And then again there, you can just kind of see there's, you know, there's really not, not much around it and the tracks in front of it. So the new depot opens on August 5th, 1906. It's this big day, grand occasion. James J. Hill attends the opening in person, and he gave a speech proclaiming the depot as, quote, the handsomest and best built structure of its kind on the entire great northern system. High praise from the Empire Builder. Um, it boasted steam heat, gas lighting, and bathrooms. Very exciting. Uh, the heat still works in there. When I was there about two weeks uh, ago, the heat was on, so I, I felt that when I was there. And Big Island Park also opened on the same day. So a very big day for Wyzetta for Lake Minnetonka. And the depot today, um, it serves as a depot until 1971 when it closes, and the following year, the Burlington Northern Railway, which was after the Great Northern, uh, merged with some other lines, uh, the continuation of that company. They donated the depot to the city of Wyzetta, and it houses the Wyzetta Historical Society and the Wyzetta Area, Area Chamber of Commerce. So, and in conclusion, so why I thought about this as I was kind of putting this presentation together. You know, why do we still tell this story about Wyzetta and about James J. Hill? Certainly part of the reason is, you know, we have James J. Hill days, which started in 1975. Uh, but I was thinking about it, and it's really, it's this David and Goliath story, which I think is just so fascinating. You have this small village taking on the powerful Great Northern Railway and the empire builder himself at a time when railroads were probably at the peak of their power in this country. And it's a really interesting, so it's a really interesting story. And the village wins, at least the first lawsuit, they win. You know, he has to clean up that area. And there's kind of a, a sort of split uh, between why people uh, or how, how people talk about James J. Hill. Um, you know, some people argue that because the, because the Great Northern wins the lawsuit about not having to move the tracks, you still have the lakefront, uh, the lakefront area gets preserved. It didn't, you know, it didn't become private property and people didn't, you know, build giant homes right on it or develop it in some other way. So they really, you know, thank James J. Hill for that. So, some people apparently, I'm not sure who these people are, but call him Saint Jim Hill for saving the lakefront. And then contrast that with the rhyme that supposedly went around Wyzetta in the 1890s, twixt hill and hell, there's just one letter. Were hill in hell, we'd feel much better. <laughs> so. So you have this kind of contrast between, you know, St. James Hill and people wanting to see him in hell. So pretty interesting. Um, and I think it also, you know, just shows what an interesting person James J. Hill was um, and, how, and how central the Great Northern Railway was to this area um, and to Wyzetta at that time. So that, 
that does it. Thank you very much for listening.